continuing our verse by verse study in 1 Corinthians. This morning we're going to be finishing up chapter 12. And I had thought we were going to go into chapter 13, but the Lord had other plans. We're going to start at verse 12, by the way, of 1 Corinthians 12. That's where we left off last week. And it's not because we weren't going to have time to go into chapter 13. But I wanted to take a little bit of time with everybody here uh, to talk about specifically two spiritual gifts that are somewhat misunderstood many times in the church. And of course, those are gifts of tongues and of prophecy. So at the end of our study through chapter 12, just hang with us, stick with us here. I'll continue on to talk about those two gifts. I mean, we're going to go, I mean, this is going to be a deep dive into those gifts. This is not, you know, something you're going to go somewhere else and get. This is the only, the deep kind of dive that we do here at Calvary Chapel, all right? So pay attention to that. You'll want to take notes. If you don't have a bulletin, grab one. There's a place for you to put notes in there, or you can write in your Bible, certainly. The teaching application verse. For this morning. Oh, by the way, uh, keep Gladys's daughter in prayer, uh, Sarissa. She is has been in the hospital of, for the past couple of days, um, so keep her in prayer. Uh, I would I would greatly appreciate that as well. And it seems like there was one other thing I wanted to tell you guys about, but I can't think of it right now. I should have written it down. Uh, teaching application verse for this morning is Psalm chapter one fifteen verse one. It says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we put ourselves before you this morning. We come before your throne and we ask that you would speak to us. Lord, as we study your written word, your inspired word, we pray that you would place it in our hearts, that we would be doers of your word, not hearers only. Lord, we ask that you would encourage us this morning, that you would comfort us this morning, that you would guide us this morning, that the words that I speak would be glorifying and pleasing to you and edifying to this body. Lord, we lift up to you those who are not here this morning who might be sick or something else going on. We just ask that you would heal them and be with them. We pray these things in the name of your precious, precious Son, Jesus. Amen. A man from Illinois decided to travel to Wisconsin to go duck hunting. He shot a bird, and it fell on the other side of a fence in a farmer's field. Now, the man climbed that fence and went over to the field, and just when he did that, here comes the dairy farmer on his tractor driving up, and, and the guy says, what are you doing? This is my property. The hunter said, well, I, I shot a duck, and, and I'm retrieving it. And the farmer replied, well, this is my property. You're not coming over here to retrieve your duck. Of course, that made the hunter mad. And so he said, well, if you don't let me come over this fence into your property, I'm going to have my big-name Chicago lawyer sue you. And the farmer smiled and he said, well, apparently you don't know how we do things up here. We settle disagreements with the Wisconsin three-kick rule. See, I'll kick you three times, then you kick me three times, and so on back and forth until one of us just gives up. The man thought, well, that's a, that's a great challenge. This is, he's older. I bet, I, I bet I'm already one up on him. I bet I can beat him in this. And the farmer climbed down from his tractor and planted the, the steel toe of his heavy work boot into the man's shin. The man fell to his knees. His second kick went directly to the man's stomach, knocking the wind out of him. The farmer then landed his third kick to the side of the hunter's head. The disoriented man said, okay, you old codger, 
Now it's my turn. To which the farmer responded, nah, I give up. You can have the duck. It's funny, but people do argue over the stupidest things. And that's so in the church as well. There are arguments, there are divisions among Christians about things that are clearly spelled out for us in Scripture. But we want to hold on to our view. We don't want to have to change our view to meet Scripture. And so we argue and we divide over things. Christians for a number of years have been trying to define the meaning of two things. Tongues, or, or glosa in the Greek, and prophecy, or propheteia in the Greek. Now, as we observed last week, there are many gifts that the Spirit of God might impart to the believer. In verse 4 of chapter 12, Paul had said, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, diversities is the Greek word uh, diaresis. It means difference and variety. In fact, diversities in verse 4 of chapter 12, where it's in regards to gifts, is the same Greek word as differences in verse 5 in regard to ministries, and it's the same Greek word in verse 6 in regards to activities. And we see in verses 8 through 10, then a diverse list of gifts, all given by the same Spirit according to the will of God. Now we should remember from last week that that list of gifts from chapter 12 is not a definitive list. Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church. He was dealing with things that were going on in the Corinthian church. And that list is tailored to the believers in that church. So there are other spiritual gifts that aren't listed here. And as we continue our verse-by-verse study, we'll hit on those. Now, we observe in God's creation astounding variety. I mean, just go outside or look out the windows. And you can see all kinds of variety in trees and the weather patterns and all these things. God has not created each person the same as the other person. Look in here. Look around. And we're all different. There's a lot of variety here. Now, we may be similar in some ways. I've been told by others that they saw my twin you know, somewhere that they traveled to. I think it was Brad Pitt they were talking about. <laughs> I'm kidding, but but I have been told that you know somebody I, a while back somebody said they were traveling somewhere and they walked up to somebody from behind thinking it it was me you know and they were surprised <laughs> to see me there and, and tapped them on the shoulder shoulder and turned around and no it wasn't me but it, apparently it looked very much like me at least from the back. Poor guy, <laughs> feel sorry for him. But while we're all unique, God created our basic functions to operate in the same way. And the same thing can be said about spiritual gifts. Paul recognized that every Christian is given at least one spiritual gift. And that gift functions in the same manner for everyone who has that gift. Now, there are different degrees of ability with the gifts, One person might have a more developed gift of administration than another. Another might have a gift of healing that operates in restoring relationships, while someone else's gift of healing is toward the physical body. Each gift is to be operated and motivated by love. In that way, the use of that gift is in all ways glorifying to Jesus. Now, the New Testament consistently talks about allotments of various kinds, differing gifts, differing callings, differing ministries, and so forth. But consistently, all those conglomerate into a single purpose. When I was studying geology in college, we had to memorize all these different rock types, and one of those types was a conglomerate, a conglomerate rock. And... Conglomerate rock is just basically a lot of little rocks that have in some way through pressure or some other fashion been cemented together into one big rock. 
when I was uh, working in a, a R&D lab, uh, do, working with some asphalt and, and things like that, you know, you, you could look, pick up a, a core of asphalt, and it was technically a conglomerate because it had all the gravel and stuff in there mixed in with the tar and the different things. So it's various rocks that have been bonded together for a common purpose. Now, the, that purpose of using gifts is like that. We, we all have differing gifts, but we are bonded together in the body of Christ for one purpose. The purpose of using gifts is to do the will of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 6, the same God who works all in all. And Paul says in verse 7 that the proper use of spiritual gifts is to profit to the profit of all Christians. The whole body, we're all the better for it. But in the Corinthian church, it wasn't every spiritual gift that was at issue. It was what we would consider the more miraculous gifts, the, the more flashy gifts, I guess you might say. And, and so that list of gifts that Paul gave to us from verses 8 through 10 was these, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, uh, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. And we talked last week about each one of those gifts, if you missed that, you can go back and you can listen to it on our website or watch the video. The reason why Paul is broaching this topic of spiritual gifts with the Corinthians is that the improper use of gifts was exacerbating division in the fellowship. You see, while the richer Corinthians, they distinguished themselves from the poor uh, the poorer Corinthians, by segregating themselves off and having their agape feast with, while the, the poorer ones were left out to the side. Now, the, the poorer congregants then wanted to exert something against the, the ones, the richer as well. And what they could do was then focus on hyper-spirituality. Turn back with me real quick to chapter 11 and verse 18. Oh, back to verse 17, sorry. It says, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, for those who are approved may be recognized among you. And so you had these factions, uh, different, in fact, as we've studied through 1 Corinthians, we've seen that, that there were factions or divisions of Christians within the Corinthian church, all because of all manner of different kinds of things, whether it was following a particular teacher, claiming that I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Jesus, um, uh, and all these other things that we've talked about, including even the agape feast. And now Paul is pointing out spiritual gifts are being used to divide themselves. And so there was this kind of combative attitude at work in the church. In fact, the final verse of chapter 12, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we will, but the final verse of chapter 12, it testifies of this division. Where it says, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now what's interesting is there is an unspoken you in that verse. And so a better translation of that verse is, however, you earnestly desire the best gifts. Again, Paul's telling them that they are allowing the gifts to cause division to their own detriment. And then Paul promises, I'm going to show you a better way, a, a superior manner of thinking. In chapter 13, we find that the proper use of the gifts causes the love of God for his people to be magnified. And Paul focuses on the gifts of tongues and of prophecy. So it would seem that those two gifts in particular were causing division in the church, and they still do today. Not so long ago, John MacArthur held a conference called Strange Fire. At that conference, 
he rebuked and denounced the charismatic movement. Now, Pastor MacArthur, he is a brother in Christ. He's also a cessationist, teaching that the gifts of the Spirit are not in operation today. In fact, he even made this extreme statement, the charismatic movement is largely the reason the church is in the mess that it's in today. In virtually every area where church life is unbiblical, you can attribute it to the charismatic movement. I have a problem with that. The, the issue, the greatest issue with church, what's causing so much trouble in church today, is sin. It's bringing the world into church instead of taking the church to the world. Recently, at Pastor MacArthur's church, a man from Scotland jumped up on the stage and interrupted the church service. And he went on stage and he called John MacArthur out for being divisive and denying the gifts of the Spirit. Now, cessationists believe that the gifts are done. They're no longer in operation today. Continuationists believe the gifts are in operation today. The Bible falls in the middle. It says that when Jesus returns, there are certain gifts that will cease. So you, you see that the topic of gifts, it still causes division in the church today. Today we're going to finish out chapter 12. And then as I said, we're going to zoom in on those two gifts, tongues and prophecy, in preparation for our study next week in chapter 13. And then also when we move on to chapter 14, that's still going to be an issue that we'll be dealing with. Now the goal of our teaching today is to learn what the proper use of spiritual gifts is. We will also do a deep dive to learn about the biblical gifts of of tongues and prophecy. So let's pick it up with verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, picking up with verse 12. It says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, it is, is it therefore not of the body? We've all been gifted differently. And we serve differently. Philippians 2.13 reminds us, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, because God is at work within us, we can accomplish his purposes. Gifts are given to be used. We recognized last week that in this chapter, Paul gave us five directives regarding the spiritual gifts. The first one was be informed about spiritual gifts. Lots of Christians are either ignorant of the gifts or they've been taught wrong on scriptural things about those gifts of the Spirit. Secondly, be influenced by the Holy Spirit. Our focus must be on the giver, not on the gifts themselves. Before we were saved, we were led astray by many, many things. Now that we are believers, the Holy Spirit empowers and energizes us for ministry. Third is incorporate multiplicity in your understanding. We all have different kinds of gifts. There are different ways to serve. And there are different workings of the Spirit. The fourth was identify your spiritual gift. We've all been given gifts for the common good or the profit of the church. Operating in your gift is both satisfying personally and it's also edifying to the church body. Fifth, use your gifts in love. Having spiritual gifts does not necessarily make you spiritual. Gifts are to be used in love. And Paul says that is the most excellent way. So we left off last week having addressed four of those directives. We pick it up today with that fifth directive, use your gifts in love. Verses 12 through 30, they describe how the church is like a human body. 
Each part plays a critical role in the functioning of the body. And, and you've, you've each been given gifts and, and a key role to play in this church. Together, we are the church. When you implement your gifts, your church will mature in faith. And although you are a very diverse group, there's probably no group more diverse than this one. Even though you are a very diverse group, each of you belong to one body. There's no stars. There's no lone rangers. Now look at verse 14 there. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. The foot needs the hand. The ear needs the eye. Likewise, we all need one another. When a Christian hoards their gifts and just doesn't use them, the entire body is then handicapped. Now, I don't say this to, to try and manipulate anybody to serve. I, I'm not going to manipulate people into serving or into giving. But when I, when I tell you this, the reason why I'm telling you this is so that when you do serve, you know that the whole body reaps benefit. Sometimes we need to sit in service for a season. Sometimes we need to just be filled. And that is a great thing. But we also, there comes a point in time at which we need to serve. Those things, the, those good things that we're filled with can overflow into the rest of this body and bless us all. I believe that the Holy Spirit will move each of us to serve when it is time. And, and I don't have to help the Holy Spirit to do that. But sometimes we may not serve because we feel like our gift isn't as important as some other gifts. I don't want you to think that at all. And, and so I want you to understand that your gift is important. There is not one gift that outshines the others. The church at Corinth had elevated some of the sign gifts and, and had relegated the lesser gifts to second-class status. It's very easy for us to do that too, especially with the more lively gifts. We think, well... You know, that's really all the body needs. They, the body just needs, you know, superstar evangelists and, and healers. We think we don't need people who are gifted to do things that are invisible to everyone else. But that, that's listening to the enemy who doesn't want you to use your gifts. I had a, a toolkit. At one time, those tools are now scattered around here in different places. But I used to have an assembled toolkit. Uh, we've done a lot of work in this place, and, and you know that's just how that's what happens when you're doing a lot of work and when you're busy with the tools. But I, you know, at one time I had this assembled toolkit, and in that toolkit was a little screwdriver. And the end of that thing, it was just way too little for anything. We were never going to, you know, I would never find a screw anywhere around, I thought, that would be useful, that, that little screwdriver would be useful for. And then one day, my glasses fell apart. And I thought, oh, I need that screwdriver. And it was there when I needed it. No other screwdriver would have done the job. Just that one. And because that screwdriver worked, I was able to wear my glasses and see where I was going. So that tool, though it was small, was very important. But sometimes our gifts are invisible simply because we don't use them. You know, if you own a set of tools, do you spend all your time just counting them, laying them out, and looking at them, maybe polishing them and putting them on display? Or do you use them? So it is with the gifts of the Spirit. They're, they're not things just to admire. They're to be used. They're not medals to be won. They're not trophies to, to be displayed. They're not treasures to be guarded. Very often it's as you serve that God will reveal the gifts that he has given you. And, you know, this, this church, though we are a small church, we have every gift gift 
that is needed in order to function as a biblical community. We're one body, not all of us are the same. It's unity without uniformity. Now that, that goes against our, our normal human tendency towards conformance. That is, everybody needs to be you know, totally equal in everything or it's just not fair. The problem is, is looking at it that way, that still equates one person's gift as more important than someone else's. As the pastor, I am, I am no more important than anyone else. What's important is that I function in the body in the way that God has called me to function. And the same is true for each one of us. Emphasizing this, Paul uses body, the Greek word soma, 18 times in this chapter. And he does so for the same reason he did in chapter 10. That is to underscore the importance of unity in the church. The church of Christ is like a body. A body, by definition, is a combination of very different parts. Other letters of Paul's contain that exact same imagery. Ephesians does, Colossians does, for the same purpose, unity. Let's keep going. Verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the uh, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? The diversity of gifts God gives is what makes the body strong. I might have teaching gifts. You might be strong in prayer. Others might be gifted in giving or in administration or the ability to impart a trust in God. Without you, I can't do my job effectively, and none of us are effective without one another. We rely on one another. Verse 18, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if, there were, if they were all one member... Where would the body be? Now, But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow great honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers... All the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We shouldn't aspire to have the more valuable gifts. Nor should we look at others and want them to be like us. Paul says that God wants us to treat those who have gifts that might be seen as less honorable or even unpresentable with extra special care. It's like comparing the eye to the stomach. The stomach is certainly it's not a very appealing part of the body. You know, no one walks around with stomach t-shirts or, you know, stomach bumper stickers on their car. There's, there is a stomach.com, I checked. It belongs to a gastroenterologist. <laughs> yeah, consider, consider the eye. You know, it's, it's a pretty flashy part of the body. But it's not essential to life. You can live without an eye. In fact, many, many people live very well without sight or without hearing. But without medical intervention, you can't live without a stomach. An example of this in the body of Christ might be a gift that functions in the background instead of up front. Maybe, maybe you clean the church bathrooms or participate in the nursing home ministry. Maybe you just pray quietly for the church or, or for me at home. 
there isn't much applause, there isn't much honor for those types of things, but those things are very, very important. Paul is telling us to value those who do background things just as much as others. So to complete this part of his argument, Paul gives a list of gifts, but his point is to set up a hierarchy. His point is that there can be unity without uniformity, equality without similarity. And if one member suffers, the whole body suffered, suffers. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, variety, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So here, Paul affirms the equality of gifts while at the same time arranging them in order. They're arranged in descending order according to their usefulness to the congregation. Now that should draw our attention then to the fact that Paul puts tongues where on this list? Last. After helps. After the gift of helps. You know what the gift of helps would include? Janitorial work. Administrators. Event organizers. You mean tongues is not more important than that? No. It's not. In chapter 13, Paul will demonstrate that that highly desired gift of tongues and prophecy were actually the least useful for building one another up. And again, Paul notes that the Corinthians earnestly desire what they consider to be the best gifts. And we know that they leveraged those gifts as better because they were flashier. Paul says, however, I show you a better way. Now to this point, there are a few things that we need to put together from our chapter. First, don't be afraid to step out in your gift. As long as you belong to Jesus, he will guide you. Secondly, ask God to reveal your gift or gifts to you. You know, what if, what if Mozart never learned to play the piano? You have a gift. Take the time to learn about it. it. It might be something that you are already good at, or it might be something that you just enjoy doing. Third, you have been arranged in the body of, in the body of Christ just as God intended. So don't try to be an eye if you're really an ear. Fourth, my gift is dependent on yours. In our physical body, all the parts are integrated. Not one part of the body is better off without any other part. They're all need, they all need one another. I might bring a word of wisdom on Sunday, then you know, you having a gift of, uh, of knowledge are able to, to help uncover a hidden hurt in a friend using that wisdom. Then another comes up to that person and encourages them. God uses all our gifts together. I can't do the Lord's work without you, and you can't do it without me. And finally, make sure not to overemphasize the more spectacular gifts. Because the less spectacular are just as vital. Now, let's, let's pause here before we get into chapter 13, which we'll do next week. There Paul is going to narrow some things down to tongues and prophecy. I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time talking about these 
due to how they are often represented. See, people have notions about the, these gifts, and much of that is driven by books and Christian television. And of course, people want to read their own desires and their own experiences into these things, as well as their own theological framework. Now, I imagine if we if we added up everyone's experience, we would we would have you know just about every possible interpretation of the biblical text. But what we want to have, what we want is to have what we believe and what God's written word says match up. So then we need to understand what 1 Corinthians means in its original context. That way, we may apply it more carefully to our current times. Now, to those ends, we have some dependable resources that we can use. First, of course, is the biblical text itself. The official organization of the New Testament was recognized in 170 AD. Now, those books were considered scripture before that time, way before that time. The Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament. The New Testament books reference other New Testament books. Now secondly, the history of the church also sheds light on the experience of the first century church. The fact that church fathers of the second century and later claimed that prophecy and tongues were being experienced in their own day would seem to conflict with the notion of those gifts ending with the completion of the canon of Scripture. By the way, when I say canon of Scripture, I'm not talking about a canon you're shooting Scripture at somebody. It's the books of the Bible. It's just been the inspired books have been put together and recognized as what we have, that, that these, all these books belong in the Word of God. All these books belong in the Bible. So we can surmise that the early church fathers perceived there to be an unbroken continuation of the spiritual gifts from the apostolic age. In the 160s AD, there was a, a false movement that was going on uh, involving prophecy. Um, and the church leaders all came against it. The early church fathers came against it. And they wrote about it. And they wrote how they, they wrote their explanation of what was wrong with it. And so we can look back at that and again see that obviously the spiritual gifts, the way that they came against that was not saying the spiritual gifts have ceased. But they were saying, no, the spiritual gifts operate in this way. And we can know if somebody is using these spiritual gifts properly what by when when they do it this way and it lines up with scripture so in in, in coming against i think it was monasticism if i remember correctly in doing so they, they contrast that movement with what true prophecy looks like and therefore they shed light on on these true uh charismatic gifts so let let's this is where we're going to start our deep dive. We're going to start our deep dive here. In order for us to understand what Paul says here about the, the charisma or, or spiritual gifts of tongues and prophecy, let's consider some key questions in regards to tongues. Are tongues human languages, angelic languages, or unintelligible noise? Secondly, what is the relationship between tongues in 1 Corinthians and tongues as we see it in Acts? Third, what was the content of tongues? All right, now regarding prophecy, we've got three questions we're going to ask that are going to reveal to us the true nature of prophecy. Um, it was, the first one is what is, the, what is the nature of New Testament prophecy? Secondly, what is the content of prophecy? And third, was prophecy infallible? Was prophecy, prophecy infallible? So let's, let's start with tongues. Are tongues human languages, angelic languages, or unintelligible noise? Outside of 1 Corinthians, 
the only certain references to speaking in tongues are in Acts chapter 2, and that's when the, the Holy Spirit came upon uh, the disciples, the apostles, and they were speaking in the language, they were speaking in tongues, and those languages that they were speaking were being understood by the people that had come to Jerusalem for that pilgrimage feast. Um, Acts chapter 10, where uh, Cornelius' household, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Uh, Acts chapter 19 as well. Now in Acts in Acts 2, which I already mentioned this, but in Acts 2, the, that day of Pentecost, the apostles found themselves speaking in tongues publicly. Now, listen to how that mixed crowd, that crowd of people that had traveled from all over, not just Israel, but, but Jews who were dispersed over a wide area had, had come back to Jerusalem for, this, uh, for Pentecost. Listen to how they responded. They said in Acts chapter 2, verse 11, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Later in Acts 10 and 19, people spoke in tongues at the receiving of the gospel and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Looking at Acts 2, 4, the apostles spoke in tongues before people drew near and heard their own languages. The situation in 1 Corinthians was very similar. There a person might speak in tongues even when there is no one who happens to know that language. In Acts 2, foreigners understood the tongues as their own languages. The hearers were not believers. And so they did not have a spiritual gift of interpretation. So then the tongues were known languages. Some have interpreted 1 Corinthians in the same manner. You know, the Corinthians spoke foreign human languages that needed an interpretation. But others have argued that the gift in Corinth was an entirely different sort of experience. Now, what is the evidence? Well, first, in 1 Corinthians 13.1, there is a reference to speaking in tongues of angels. Some have taken this as the Corinthians were speaking in heavenly tongues that no human could possibly understand. However, it's better to interpret the phrase as overstatement in order to make a point. It's like, like a parent, we might say to our child, I don't care if you have all the time in the world, you're doing your homework now. It's that overstatement to reinforce something you want the hearer to understand. Another explanation is that the tongues in 1 Corinthians were not languages at all, but you know, mysteries in the sense that the sounds have no intrinsic meaning. The best interpretation is that in Corinth, as it was at Pentecost, tongues were foreign human languages, probably languages that nobody in the congregation knew. So let's, let's put some dots together. Let's, let's assemble some things together and see if this makes sense. If the early church knew of two distinct gifts that were both called speaking in tongues, surely that would have been spelled out in the apostles' writings. Secondly, Paul compares tongues to foreign human languages in 1 Corinthians 14.21. Look with me there real quick. It says... With men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that, they will not hear me. So they have meaning, but the meaning is not known because the language is unfamiliar. Third, as with human languages, the tongue spoken means something. Paul says in chapter 14 that without an interpreter, an onlooker could say in verse 16, he does not know what you are saying. So then tongues are not an unintelligible noise, but can be understood by someone who knows the language. And so in the Corinthian church, an interpreter can say in Greek what the speaker said in another language. Therefore, tongues are understandable to someone who, as in Acts chapter 2, knows the language. 
Now, Chrysostom, an, an early church father, he said many tongues used to go into one man, and he would pray and speak in tongues in Persian and Latin and Indian and in many other languages while the Spirit was speaking through him. Another early church father, uh, Theodoret of Cyrus, said that someone who spoke in tongues would be speaking the language of the Scythians or the Thracians. Okay. So we've kind of established that. The second question, what is the relationship between tongues in 1 Corinthians and tongues in Acts? We need to consider this. The one experience of tongues functions differently in Acts than it does in 1 Corinthians. In Acts 2, 10, and 19, the tongues demonstrate that the Spirit has fallen on people. Acts never mentions how tongues functioned in the Christian's devotional life or in the church. 1 Corinthians deals exclusively with later times and says nothing about the initial experience of tongues. Also, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12.30 that not all speak in tongues. Now, there, there are some, some churches, some um, denominations of, of churches, I guess you might say, who will say that if you do not speak in tongues, then you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and you can take that further down the line, and, and it's, then you're not saved. It's a, tongues, then, they say, is an evidence that you're saved. They, if you carry that on down the, the logical line, Paul did not agree with that. He said, not all speak in tongues. Now, there's a teaching out there that says, every Christian speaks in tongues as a prayer language for use in private. But also that not every Christian has the gift of speaking in tongues for the purpose of giving a revelation to the whole church. The problem is that nowhere does Paul differentiate between any such categories of tongues. According to Paul, one either does or does not. And many Christians do not and should not be concerned about it. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul assumes that people who speak in tongues pray in tongues. So Paul speaks of two functions of the one gift, but nowhere speaks of two distinct gifts of tongues. Now I should mention here that Paul says that the gift of tongues, like the gift of prophecy, is controllable. 1 Corinthians 14, 28. Paul says there, but if there is no interpreter... Let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. In 1 Corinthians 14.32, Paul says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Both, both the gifts may be exercised intentionally in a way that seeks the best edification for the church. Paul says that the spirit gives these spiritual gifts and God is a God not of disorder but of peace. All right, now, what is the content of tongues? In every instance in the New Testament, when tongues are interpreted, it turns out that the words were God-directed. They spoke, they spoke the gospel in tongues. They gave praise and thanksgiving in tongues. Now, this fits very well, then, with tongues as we see in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Again, remember, verse 11 said that the onlookers heard the wonderful works of God. That is, praise about God. Pastor Chuck used to, to tell of a prayer meeting where someone he knew very well began to speak or began to pray in French. They didn't know French. But they prayed en français. <laughs> now, I myself, I have never experienced anyone speaking in a known language which they themselves didn't know. At the same time, I believe that the gifts are for today, and should they be needed, they will manifest. But what we might hear on Christian television or on YouTube is questionable as to being the biblical gifts of tongues, as we see it defined by Luke 
in Acts and Paul in his letters. Now, whether God is working through that experience, that's for him to say. Now, let's move on to prophecy. And the reason why we're doing this, remember, is so that we are better prepared when we get into chapters 13 and 14. All right, so what is the nature of New Testament prophecy? Some in in the past, in, in ancient days, also, though, in recent times, have suggested that prophecy was the gift of interpretation of the Old Testament. In other words, it was inspired exegesis. Now, we talked about exegesis in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Exegesis means to stick to the intended meaning of the text. So, inspired exegesis is a supernatural expounding on biblical principles. While similar to prophecy... Preaching or teaching is not the same. It is not prophecy. Preaching and teaching is the gift of presenting God's word to others in a faithful and spiritually powerful manner. Prophecy in the New Testament is the supernatural receiving and giving of information. That information is in accord in all ways with the Bible, but it's not a written part of it. In the New Testament, people gifted by God would speak a supernatural message to believers or even to unbelievers. Remember, there was a time when the New Testament canon was just being written. Now that we have the full canon of Scripture, any prophecy must line up and never disagree with Scripture. A good definition is occasional inspiration and revelation that lines up with Scripture. Prophecy is not always relating to future events. It may relate to faith or to duty. It may be an impulse or an aid from the Holy Spirit to present truth and evoke conviction and repentance. Prophecy is supernatural revelation. So then it may take the form of predicting the future, or speaking into the present. For instance, in Acts chapter 27, Paul predicted that the ship he was on would be destroyed, but that everyone on board would be saved. Paul also, in his letters, wrote about distant end times events, such as the rapture of the church. The early church father Arrhenius said that Prophets in the late second century church prophesied about the present and also have foreknowledge of things to come. Now, God testifies of himself that he is without change. God will not ever disagree with himself. And so a very important test of prophecy is whether it lines up with or conflicts with Scripture. One other thing that I should mention is that Paul lets us know that prophecy is not spectacle. As with speakers and tongues, prophets too remain in control of themselves. And they were able to prophesy in an orderly manner that glorified God rather than self or the gift. They do not suddenly begin to shout And then wake up as if out of a trance and ask, what did I say? Now, the second question we need to consider is, what was then the content of prophecy? Unlike tongues, prophecy is usually directed toward human beings and from God. Prophecy accomplishes one of several things. uh, Predicting the future in some cases. Directing people to take a specific action. Revealing God's knowledge of what is hidden in the human heart. Giving people divine encouragement. And praise directed to God. The role of the New Testament prophet often differs from that of the Old Testament counterpart. In the New Testament, the apostles were the ones who wrote and taught what was doctrine. The prophet gave directions from God and applied God's truth to a specific situation. The Old Testament prophets spoke about the redemption of Israel, the calling of the Gentiles, the incarnation of Christ. 
The New Testament prophets prophesy about particular things or people. As Peter prophesied about Ananias in Acts uh, chapter 5, for example. Remember when Ananias tried to misrepresent his giving, Peter was given supernatural revelation of his deed. Peter said in Acts chapter 5, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourselves? So Peter received prophetic revelation of Ananias' deception. There are exceptions to the rule that doctrine and prophecy were given separately, however. There are instances in the New Testament where the Spirit gives a message which we would consider to be doctrinal. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul quotes a word of the Lord about the resurrection of the uh, Christian dead, of those who, were, who had died in Christ. The same when in chapter 15 of, of 1 Corinthians here, Paul reveals a mystery. Paul also predicts future apostasy in 1 Timothy, saying the Spirit, the Spirit clearly says. Ephesians 2.20 says the apostles worked with the prophets to provide a doctrinal foundation for the early church. By and large, however, New Testament prophets spoke their message based on biblical truths that were already known. For instance, revealing sins that are hidden in the heart of someone who's present. Now, what we hear argued today regarding prophecy being a retired spiritual gift is that if God were giving prophecy, then it must need then to be written down or added to the Bible. But that is a false assumption that is driven by a couple of things. First, false prophets who try to present new revelation that contradicts Scripture. There's been an overreaction that in a lot of ways has been like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Secondly, those who claim prophecy is not for today, they have a distorted understanding of the New Testament gift. You know, the 39 books of the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament, are God's revelation to the church of all time. Thank goodness that the church is not to write down and circulate prophecies, such as, you know, Stephen is secretly coveting. You know, so we wouldn't want that to be, you know, just circulated out for everyone to know. But that does then give Stephen the opportunity to be convicted of that sin and repent. Prophecy as a New Testament spiritual gift is God's direction of a local church. It's not his word for all time. And that takes us to our final question that needs to be answered about prophecy. Was prophecy infallible, or is prophecy infallible? Paul says that Christians must take prophecy very seriously. But he also wants the churches to carefully analyze prophetic speak. In chapter 14, Paul will say, 14 verse 29, say, let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20, do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. In the Old Testament, the penalty for false prophecy was death. The implication is that a true prophet will receive a divine message and communicate it accurately. And when Paul tells the churches to discern prophecy, he means to determine whether the content is true whether the prophet is of godly character, or whether the message accords with the apostolic doctrine. Early church writings put it this way, but not everyone who speaks in the Spirit is a prophet. Only he is a prophet who has the ways of the Lord about him. By their ways will the false prophet and the prophet be known. And any prophet who teaches the truth but does not do what he teaches is a false prophet. Would that Christians today applied that kind of wisdom, right? Throughout the Bible, prophets who were often or usually correct were called false prophets. 
So also today, a prophet who does not meet the criteria above, the criteria we just spoke about, should also be considered false. Now, tongues in, in Acts or in 1 Corinthians, those are that's a spiritual gift of speaking in an unknown human language. It, it may function as a sign of the Spirit's presence and serve as a private prayer language or as a means of declaring God's praises in a meeting. The need for an interpreter demonstrates that the gifted person spoke not knowing what he was saying. However, the speaker, whether of tongues or prophecy, was to remain under his own control. Paul's only objection to uninterpreted tongues was that while they made the speaker feel close to God, they did not help other Christians, which was the very purpose of the spiritual gift. Now, prophecy might be praise directed toward God, but it is usually a message from God to humans. It's directly given by God, and prophecy is either all true or it's all false. In the New Testament, prophecy usually functions on a more personal and local level than in the Old. The prophet senses when something is revealed to him. He does not lose control. He does not go into some state of unconsciousness. He can share the word when he wants, when it's appropriate, when it's orderly, and in a way that's going to glorify and magnify God and edify the congregation. So I'm not prophesying this morning, but I do want to share a prophecy with you. And that is this. In Hebrews 9.27, says, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Sin will be judged. And the Bible says that those who do not receive Jesus as Lord and Savior will perish. But the good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And that through him we have forgiveness in salvation. And if you have not called on Jesus as your Lord and your Savior to receive forgiveness and salvation, then please, please do so. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it goes on to say that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't matter what you did in the past. Doesn't matter what you did this morning. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to share another scripture with you to end with this morning. Another word of prophecy from Scripture. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18 says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the, the gifts, the things that you have gifted us with. We all have a spiritual gift. We may have more than one. And we each desire to use the gift that you have given us to be a blessing to one another. To bring together the church and never to cause division. Father, we ask that you give us wisdom in the use of our gifts. And Father, if 
if we're waiting for a door to be opened in which to use our gift, then Lord, I pray that you would open that door and show it to us. Because the whole church is better off when we are all operating in the gifts and the calling that you've given us. Lord, we thank you that we have your word, your written word here, and we can test all things by it. I pray that we would be faithful to do so. Lord, in this day there is so much deception. There is so much false teaching. There are so many who take Scripture and twist it to make it about people, about us. But Lord, Your Word is the revelation of Your Son. And may He be magnified. So, Lord, as we continue to study through your word in the coming weeks or even years, should you tarry, we ask that you would give us proper understanding. Lord, thank you that for the time being we can gather together and worship together and read your word together and study. Lord, I pray that we would never take that for granted. We desire to be doers of your word, not hearers only. Lord, we lift up to you those who are sick in this body and ask that you would heal them. Those who are hurting in this body, perhaps emotionally, that you would heal them. We thank you so much for the teachers and children's ministry and their heart and desire to disciple our kids. We thank you that you love us so much. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen.